Welcome to Oliver Travel Trailers. I'm the service manager, Jason Estry, and today we're gonna to do a delivery walkthrough on a Legacy Elite. Now here in the front, uh, we have your front jack. I do wanna point out that these are stabilization jacks, not leveling jacks. Uh, but on the front jack, of course, same as the Elite 2, you have your light uh, and your switch for your up and down motion. Uh, you also have the bubble leveler here on top. Now to remove this, in case you did have to use a manual crank, you just twist, pull this off, that gives access down inside to that manual crank area. Um, on the jack, uh, these can be turned, the head of the jack. You have three set screws here at the base of the head as it goes on to the post. Uh, you can loosen that and turn your jack head any direction that, that you so choose. Um, you may wanna turn it one direction or the other as it on the Elite impedes the storage basket option uh, a little bit. So you can loosen them up and turn it to this other direction. Uh, you may not want to turn it to the driver's side as we do have a deck port here and if you turn it to that location it, it covers up the deck port. Now the deck port of course uh, is just uh, for quick access into the LP housing. Uh, it is a smaller deck port on the smaller LP lid, uh, 4 inch instead of a 6 inch that comes standard on the Elite 2, uh, but it works the same way. You simply twist to open it up. And then that gives access where you can reach in to turn that regulator or the tanks on and off. Now let's go ahead and pull this cover off so that we can take a closer look underneath. It works the same way as you just pull it up and off. We'll set this off to the side. Now, the Legacy Elite can only house 20 pound tanks. Uh, there's not enough room for 30s. Uh, I have seen some people uh, modify and put 30s in it. However, it will rub and create fiberglass damage. So you wanna stick with the 20s. Um, of course, everything else inside is the same as the Elite 2, the same regulator that does the automatic switch over. You simply turn this manual uh, to tell it which tank you wanna pull from. Now, um, this little gauge in the front is gonna show green if the tank is on and pressurized providing gas. It'll show red if there is no gas or the tank is turned off. Now, if you turn the tank on, pressurize it and turn it off, there's still gas in the line that hasn't been used, so, so your gauge would still show green. Um, you can do one of two things with these tanks in this automatic switchover. You can turn one tank on and then only allow it access to that one tank thereby you would have to come out here when you run out to turn the other tank on, or you can open both tanks and allow the automatic switch over to, to control that. Now what will happen then is once this primary tank that it's pointing to depletes, this little lever will stay pointing this direction, it'll show a red gauge, but it will automatically start pulling from this tank. Uh, the only downside to that is you will need to check regularly to make sure you're not getting low of LP gas. The other option, of course, would be to, to purchase a, an add-on. It's an option through service uh, where little sensors are placed under each tank uh, and measures the weight of these tanks, and you can get readings on your phone inside the camper. Now, you'll notice this bracket here, again, same as the Elite 2. Uh, when we put the lid on, we just want to drop it back here behind this to help secure it before we latch it. Once it's in place, you can just kind of look behind, double check to make sure it is sitting on that bracket, and then go ahead and close these latches. All right, uh, again, this does have a storage basket on the Elite. However, it is slightly smaller than the Elite 2. Um, this is big enough to carry maybe a 2,000 watt generator 2200, uh, but only one. Uh, the Elite 2 is a little bit uh, bigger as the front tongue area is a little bit larger. Uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same design uh, as the storage basket on the Elite 2. Uh, of course, here in the front, you still have your standard 7-pin, your standard uh, safety chains. The Bulldog Coupler, uh, this operates and functions the exact same as on the Elite 2 camper. Uh, it is a 7,000 pound coupler system. Uh, of course, it works with a two-inch ball. Uh, that two-inch ball can be a standard ball. You can upgrade to the Anderson weight distribution hitch option that we have with the two-inch setup as well. 
All right, uh, we have the safety breakaway cable here, same as the one on the Elite 2. Uh, now the safety breakaway comes with a carabiner that you'll attach to the tow vehicle itself. Uh, again, depending on the tow vehicle and the style of hitch that's on there, you can attach a secondary carabiner if necessary because we do want to make sure that this gets to the tow vehicle and has a hard connection to it. Um, the additional carabiner is used in case it's not long enough as every tow vehicle is different, but this needs to be a specific link because we want this to pull before the chains do in case the, if the chains were to break, we definitely want this to pull out. Here on the Elite, we also have a front LP Quick Connect. This is an option, so you do have to ask for this upgrade. It functions and works the same as the one on the Elite 2. It's just got the cover. Uh, you open it to attach. It is still a low pressure system, so the appliance you use would need to, to function on low pressure. And uh, keep in mind that the appliance cannot have its own regulator, as this is already being regulated by the onboard regulator at the tanks. Let's go ahead and step around to the street side of the camper. Stepping down the street side of the camper, uh, it's a little different on our uh, Elite. Uh, we still have our marker lights, our reflectors, our tire and loading information, as well as our bin sticker with the date of production. Uh, you may notice here, however, our furnace is on the street side area, so this is located actually under your front dinette seat. Um, this here is just a service door. Uh, if it ever needs to be serviced, this door would be removed in order to do that. If you take a look up and under uh, on this model as well, you'll see our outside courtesy lights below the same Sani T flush uh, that flushes your black tank. Um, that's if you have the standard toilet. If you have the compost, then you wouldn't use this. We can see jack points uh, on the Elite, uh, just like on the Elite 2. Uh, this just tells you where a safe place to place a jack in case you needed it. With the single axle camper, um, if you had a blowout over here, you would have to use those jack points in, in order to raise these up. We do not recommend using the onboard jacks. Again, they are not leveling jacks. Uh, they're just for stabilization. Now here we have our power connection. It's the same power connection, same power cord as on our larger Elite 2 model. So it works the same. For this, uh, you'll notice that it's a sp specific connection, so it has to line up. Once you get it lined up, you'll press it in, make a slight turn to the right, and you'll definitely want to slide this collar on and tighten it so we have a secure connection. Be, be careful as these are plastic threads, you can strip them out very easily. Once that's good and tight, we've got a tight connection there, we should have AC power inside the camper. Now, these have the same Cooper tires, uh, they are slightly larger uh, than the ones that are on the Elite 2, um, but other than that, pretty much the exact same. They do just require 55 PSI, and they do come pre-filled with nitrogen. Now, even though it has nitrogen in it, uh, you may find it hard to find a place to get refill of nitrogen. You can go ahead and just put air in the tires. Once you do, the benefit of nitrogen is gone. However, um, the benefit of nitrogen is that it doesn't seep or leak as quickly as air does, and it doesn't fluctuate as bad under temperature changes. Um, the only time that that temperature change would really impact you is if you add tire pressure monitoring systems to the tires. Um, and then you might see a little difference where it'll drop and show a, a change in the tire pressure. Now on the Elite, uh, because it doesn't have dual axles, we don't have the standard Dexter Easy Flex, but we do add a Dexter heavy duty uh, kit to it. Uh, what that adds is greasable uh, Zerks to it. Um, you, you would have three on each side for the Elite model. We're gonna take a look at the uh, new Never Lube axles, the Legacy Elite as well. Now the Legacy Elite has the 5,200 pound single axle, 12 inch brakes. Um, the big difference for that model is we went to the Never Lube versus the, the 12 month, 12,000 mile repacking uh, of the bearings. So this is a sealed hub system. There's no reason for that yearly maintenance. 
both models do come with a five-year, 100,000-mile limited warranty through Dexter Axle. Now with this upgrade, uh, it is something that is available on older models, so you can contact the service department uh, and schedule a time to bring um, your current Oliver in and upgrade to the new Never Lube axles. Uh, the best time to do that is when it's time for your yearly maintenance so you're not paying for the repack and you're just jumping straight into the Never Lube axle, uh, going up to a much beefier axle, a larger brake, and then no longer having to worry about that yearly maintenance on the axles. Here we have the outside solar port. Now this solar port does come with the solar option if you upgrade to get the solar option. Uh, this is for a portable kit. Uh, those portable kits would need to have a charge controller already built on them as this runs directly to the battery. It, it, is, it does not run to the onboard charge controller. Now for those kits, we do have some available through the service department. Um, it is the ZAMP kit. Uh, you can use other things and actually put an adapter in there to run a different style if you already have one. Now here on the Elite model, this outside area is not storage. It's actually the battery compartment as well as some of your valves and your outside shower. We'll release this door down. The battery tray is slightly different as the area in here is smaller on the Elite. Now we're going to take a look at the Lithionics uh, 130 amp hour battery. Uh, it is an option uh, to get two of those batteries in the Oliver Legacy Elite. Now with these batteries, still the same with the LED blue rings. Uh, when they're on, that means the battery is on. When it's flashing, it means the battery is charging. Um, now with these, they're pretty similar to, to the larger as far as storage goes. You will want to discharge them down to about 50%. Uh, and if they stay in storage longer than six months, you would want to charge them back up and then discharge them back down uh, to 50%. Uh, once you do that, that's good for roughly another six months. Uh, now, if you are doing short-term store, uh, storage, uh, say where you're only going to be leaving, uh, leaving it sitting for you know two or three weeks, that's not necessary. Uh, the only time you really want to drop it to 50% for uh, storage is long-term. Uh, long-term storage is considered anything three months or longer. Uh, as far as the other operations, of this battery. Again, it is a lithium battery, so you don't really want to pay attention to the voltage as much as you want to check the state of charge. That state of charge, you're going to need the Lithionics battery app. Um, log into each battery and take a look uh, to see what the state of charge is uh, so that you'll know how much power you still have to use or if you should be charging the battery up. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Lithionics battery app. Now you will need to download this and uh, we will definitely give you some instructions on how to download it from the uh, Google Store uh, or the iTunes App Store. Uh, once you have it, you would just simply click the app. Once it pulls up, it's going to Bluetooth connect to any battery in the vicinity, so you will need to make sure that you get the number of your battery. Uh, the number of your battery is located on the top of the battery itself, uh, and you would just find that number and then locate it uh, on the phone. Once you locate it on the phone, you'll select each battery. Now this goes into each individual battery itself. It does not look at this as a, a battery bank. Uh, but once you're inside, you can take a look. It shows you what the current voltage is. If there's any current, either um, a load is going to show as a red number, uh, which means you are drawing from the batteries. Anything showing in green is going to show that the batteries are charged. Now, this particular one is at 100% right now, so there's no real charge state, and there's no load coming on the battery. Uh, we can also see the battery temperature in here uh, and how, how much time we have left roughly um, with the current state of the battery and the current load. Uh, you can also see any status codes uh, if something's going on and of course the state of the battery is on. You can scroll to the next screen, get a little bit more information broken down in a table view. You can actually see each individual cell uh, inside the app itself. So you can see each cell and what the voltage is in that. 
Uh, once you've checked one, uh, roughly both batteries should look the same. However, you can choose the other, uh, go into it and take a look at what that battery shows. Uh, this one roughly is the same. We see roughly the same voltage, no current draw right now, uh, and the battery temperature is fairly the same between the, the two of them. Uh, once you're done, you can just simply uh, close the app. Now, I would like to tell you, once you log into this battery on this device, if you have more than one uh, device, a uh, um, tablet and a phone, this device is currently locked. A tablet will not be able to even see this battery to log into it until I get completely out of it and disconnect from the app, uh, which would actually have to be closed completely out. So with the lithium batteries, they're designed for uh, boondocking. Now I do want to point uh, one thing out. Um, there's an on-off switch located in here, and that is for the heater mat. That heater mat's located underneath the batteries, and that heater mat should only be used if you are hooked to a charge source, which would be 120 volt uh, shore power or a generator, and it's freezing temperatures outside. Under freezing temperatures, the uh, lithium batteries will not charge unless they're heated uh, above that temperature. Now, the only time the batteries have to be heated uh, will be when you're looking to charge the battery in freezing conditions, uh, or if you're in really, really cold weather conditions, uh, even when using the battery. Um, outside of that, during the summer or warm months, you would always want to leave that mat turned off. Uh, if you're not charging the batteries, uh, you may want to leave it turned off based on the, ex um, the outside temperature because you will be drawing power from the battery to heat that mat. Now the mat itself does have a built-in temperature sensor. That temperature sensor is going to look at the temperature uh, and kick on and make sure that the batteries stay above freezing in order to, to charge them. Uh, and then it should automatically kick off uh, when it's not needed. Uh, however, again, I would still tell you, if there's no reason to have it on, leave it turned off. Otherwise, it's just an unnecessary draw on the batteries. Again, the cold temperature cutoff is below the 32 degrees for charging the batteries, and the cutoff is below zero degrees for discharging. You'd come out here, turn this on, uh, it'd heat up, it is built into a sensor. So basically the switch does not turn them on immediately. It just tells the sensor, hey, uh, if temperature drops below this, kick it on and it'll run it up to 45 degrees, shut itself off and, and manage it as necessary. But during the night, um, if you're boondocking and the solar is not charging these, that would be something you'd wanna come out here, flip it off and not turn it back on until the morning uh, in order to save a little bit of your battery capacity. Now, on the Elite, uh, it does have a little pin uh, designed in it. Once it's closed, to it just slide through that locks it. Uh, that way it keeps it uh, in there and makes sure that it doesn't pop loose from its little latches. Over here, we have our curbside and our street side jack switches. Um, uh, they work same as any other switches. Up is down, down is up, basically on all jacks when, when you're thinking about it because the switch is actually the uh, motion of the camper. So when you're pressing up, it's meaning to bring your camper up or down to bring your camper down um, in that relation. Now here are your blade valves, your black tank drain, your gray tank. Um, if you've got a compost toilet, you would not use the black drain. If you've got the standard, you will. Uh, and then of course your gray tank. You just pull these out, it opens that gate valve and allows it to flow down the waste pipe. Here we have our outside shower, same outside shower as uh, on the Elite 2. Uh, you've got the same shower head, the ability to, to turn the water on and off here at the faucet, otherwise it stays pressurized in the hose. You would control the hot and cold flow here at the handles, and again, uh, when you're not using it, make sure you turn these back off. Here we have our satellite and our cable connections. Um, pretty much the same as what's offered on the Elite 2. Uh, cable runs straight to the TV and the satellite runs to the rear attic where you would have to add a satellite receiver. Now, if we look below here, you'll notice that our water inlets are right opposite from the Elite 2. On the left, we have our city water and on our right, our fresh tank fill. So the fresh tank fill would be utilized if you're wanting to fill the onboard fresh tank. 
Uh, you just hook a water hose up, turn the water on until it's full, disconnect, and then you could go boondocking or wherever if you don't have a water source where you're going. Now, if you do have a water source where you're going, you definitely want to use the city water connection. Just hook up. It stays pressurized in the lines, and then you can just open the faucets, use as necessary. The only thing with that is you'd want to keep an eye on your gray tank to make sure uh, as it starts to get full that you, that you empty it in time. Now, one thing that you would not want to do with the city water inlet is if you're camping in freezing temperatures, uh, is that outside water hose would freeze. Here you have your AC drain pipe, same as on the Elite 2. Uh, when you run your AC, it uh, pulls moisture out of the inside of the camper, and most of that's going to come down this pipe. Uh, in real hu high humidity areas, you may actually notice that some of that will come off the side of the camper because uh, it may be pulling out more moisture than what the drain system can handle. Here at the back side of our Elite Camper, we also have the optional camera uh, that can be added to it right above our Oliver Lens. Now our Oliver Lens and our top red marker lights, all of that lights up uh, when your lights on the tow vehicle are on. Uh, if we go ahead and take a look down, uh, pretty much the same bumper system, same spare tire as on the Elite 2. It's just a little bit smaller, but the bumper uh, functions the same way. You just uh, pull the pins out on both sides. Hold that bumper down and that gives you access up and underneath. Now over here on this side you actually have the waste uh, pipe. Uh, we still recommend even on this model to go ahead and attach the 20 foot uh, hose that we supply uh, and then put it back here separate from, from everything else on board the camper. Uh, of course, typically you'll only want to drop this when you're draining the waste, otherwise you'll leave this bumper up in the closed position. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the spare tire cover. Uh, again, it's pretty much the same as what's on the Elite 2, just a tad bit smaller cover. You'll drop down the license plate. Now, you'll want to reach in here and pull this washer off so it doesn't go rolling across the ground when you slide the cover out. This one does fit just a little bit snugger than the Elite 2. Now, once you have the spare tire cover off, you will want to get in here and disconnect the license plate light. We can set this cover off to the side now. Then we would simply remove the bracket holding the tire on. Then slide our spare tire right off. Again, uh, the spare tire uh, does have a higher PSI in it uh, as you're not using it. That way, as some of that air or nitrogen does seep out over time, it's still above, hopefully, the 55 PSI that you want. Of course, once you've changed the tire or you're just placing this one back on, the front side of the wheel goes in against the body of the camper. You'll want to just take the wiring, slide it through the wheel. Set the tire and wheel up on the bumper and then place it back on the holder. Once you have the spare tire mounted back on, uh, you'll definitely want to lock it down in place. Once you've got that good and secure, now we can go ahead and set the spare tire cover back on. Just rest it on the bumper area, kind of slide it up into place. All right, you will have to drop the license plate holder to make sure that we get everything lined up properly. 
for the all thread. Once you have it back in place, make sure you place the washer on first, and then spin the nut back in to hold it in place. Uh, here the rear water port, uh, which you may have heard it called the boondock port. Um, it's really should be properly called a service port. And the reason is it serves the purpose of a boondock port, a winterization port, sanitization, uh, and decalcification. Um, basically, you'd hook whatever you are running into the camper here with a short two-foot hose, uh, and then down into the jug of liquid that you're trying to pull into your camper. Uh, then once you get inside, you'd actually turn the valves at the water pump so that it would pull from this port and then deliver where you want it to deliver, either straight to the faucet or to the onboard water tank. Here on the curbside of the camper, uh, up top we have our Girard awning. It is an electric awning. Uh, now on the Elite, uh, we can only install one awning. It does not uh, have the ability to have that optional secondary awning like the Elite 2. You'll also notice that we only have one porch light here, uh, and of course we still have the uh, outside courtesy lights that are lower on the frame rail of the camper. Um, if we go ahead and take a look here, this one has the uh, upgraded option, Truma On Demand. Uh, this one as well comes with a standard Suburban 6 gallon. Uh, but with this model, we've gone ahead and upgraded it to the Truma. It's the exact same Truma that comes in the Elite 2 and works the exact same way. Uh, you've got uh, on-off power here. This on-off power actually supplies power to the inside switch. So power up or down is still power on. Uh, the only time that this will default is if that inside switch does not work. And if it doesn't work, this up position defaults to eco mode the down position to comfort mode. Now the eco mode uh, maintains the mixing vessel at about 42 degrees. Uh, comfort mode maintains at 102. Uh, as soon as you open the inside faucet for hot water, the burner should fire up and deliver 125 degree water inside. Now the lever and everything works just the same. If you have water inside when you pull it, uh, it'll drain out just like that. Now, if you are winterizing, you do not want to place this back into the Truma water heater. If you're winterizing it, you're going to want to stick it right over in this area for safekeeping. Once you're done draining your Truma, if you're winterizing, uh, like I said, the filter should be over here. Uh, if you're going back together with it to use it, then you'll place the filter inside and simply press the lever and lock it in place. Now, the standard uh, filter, uh, which you just saw, is, is the one that comes with it. You can upgrade to the Truma antifreeze, uh, which will be wired in for power, 12 volt power with the little rod. Uh, we'll go over that a little bit more inside with the switch. Regardless, if you get the Truma antifreeze kit, you'll want to ho hold on to this filter as it's the one you'll use for decalcification process on the Truma. Next to the Truma water heater, we have your outside outlet. It's got a waterproof cover on it, and this outlet is tied to the GFCI outlet inside the camper. Here next to the entry door, uh, you have your vents for your refrigerator. The top vents where the hot air comes out, uh, bottom vents where cool air goes in uh, to help cool off the refrigerator. Uh, pretty much the vents work the same as they do in the larger Elite 2. You open it up, and this is where the hot air is going to vent out from the fridge. On the bottom, you can pull the vent off. This is more of a service uh, port. This is to get in and service the camper either for the gas connection, 12 volt connection, or for cleaning. Again, uh, same place. The overflow for our freshwater tank is located right here in front of the curbside tire. Uh, if you were to leave the water running when filling the fresh tank, it'll overflow in this location. Here at our entry door, it's pretty much the exact same as the Elite 2, just a tad bit smaller. We still have our bumper to protect the door from the corner, our hoop uh, and our hook uh, to hold the door open. Uh, you can still upgrade to the RV keyless entry. Uh, this just allows you to have a key code to lock and unlock the deadbolt. Uh, you still will get a set of keys. 
Uh, and again, I, I recommend keeping one set in the tow vehicle or hidden somewhere uh, just in case uh, the batteries go out in this. Uh, it will set off an alarm when the batteries are getting weak uh, to let you know. Now if we open the door up, we'll look at the inside. The screen door, of course, uh, is the exact same one on both of our models. It operates the same way. This one's just a little bit smaller, but it does connect to the main door here. So that way you can connect it and use it all as, as one door. You can close this one off and actually use this as just a screen door. Open the slide when necessary. Our stairs are pretty much the exact same from uh, our Elite 2 and our Elite models. It's a double uh, step. It's also made out of the same aircraft grade aluminum that our frame is made from, so very heavy duty and durable. Um, you can do it with one hand, so it is a one hand operation. However, because it's a long bar that slides, uh, you'll want to make sure you grab it in the center. Otherwise, if it gets off kilter, it can bind a little bit. Uh, but then to stow them, you just fold this one back up and slide this back into place. Here inside the, the door to the Elite, uh, we have our main switch panel uh, located same place in the Elite and the Elite 2 uh, and fa fairly similar. Uh, there are a few uh, changes here because we do only have one awning available. You just have an awning switch instead of a curb and a street. Uh, but pretty much all the other light combinations are the same in both. Same switches, same panel with the blue LEDs and the same master light switch. So you can turn most of your lights off as you uh, enter and exit the camper. Now let's take a look at our closet. Here inside the door, uh, we also have the closet. Uh, the closet does have your fire extinguisher that we hope you never have to use. Uh, it has the compression style latch and then you open the door to gain access. So inside the closet here on the Elite, uh, pretty much the same setup, just a bit smaller. We have two shelves, hanging rods. It's a 25 foot power cord, uh, water hose, a waste sewage hose. You'll also receive some mail quick connects if you got the uh, LP uh, quick connect option with the camper. Uh, you'll also receive a water quick connect system uh, and a water pressure regulator. Uh, again, inside this closet is the pipe for the exhaust on the plumbing system. So here, uh, your bathroom door is pretty much the same as the one in the Elite 2 and operates the same. Uh, you've got your lock here so the door won't come open. This is definitely uh, the way you'll want it when traveling. Uh, once it's unlocked, the only thing that holds it in place is a magnet. So over here on the left side of the bathroom wall, uh, you have a mystery switch. This switch is your bathroom light switch. So you will want to go ahead and turn this on before we enter the bathroom. We get inside the bathroom. It is set up pretty much the exact same as the Elite 2. Um, tad bit smaller, but uh, pretty much the same. You've got the same faucet vanity. Uh, this faucet does pull up to a shower and it operates the same with the buttons on the head uh, for a regular flow and a shower flow. Now if you look below to the vanity, uh, you also have a water pump switch up and under just in case you jump in here to take a shower and forgot to turn your water pump on. The water pump is only necessary if pulling water from your fresh tank. Uh, if you're hooked to a city water connection, then there's no, uh, no reason to have that water pump on. Uh, and in fact, if you ever turn the water pump on with no water through it, uh, you could end up burning up that pump if you run it for too long. Uh, if we look up above, you'll notice the bath fan. Now with the bath fan, it does have a handle. You just simply push the little button, push it to open. Once you have it open, you can press the other button to turn the fan on. That exhaust fan will pull out moisture or anything else that you need to exhaust out of the bathroom. Once you're done, you'd simply just turn the button allow the fan to cut off and pull it down. Once it pulls down, it'll snap in place and you're good to travel. That particular bath fan does not have a rain hood, so you do not want to have it open uh, when it's raining. However, if you do, um, the inside of the camper's fiberglass, so you'd simply just wipe up the water if it gets inside. 
Now let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, bathroom faucet. The bathroom faucet doubles as a faucet and of course your shower head. You'd simply pull it out and hang it on the hanging rod as it is now. Uh, it's got a little switch on the top of the head. Uh, you can change from standard flow to shower flow. Now we do have here in the bathroom, just in case you ever get in here and you're boondocking with fresh, uh, fresh water on board in the tank, uh, there's a water pump switch and it is located here in the vanity. Um, that way if you get in here and you've forgotten to turn the water uh, pump on, you can just turn it, uh, turn it on from inside the bathroom. Of course you've got the rods there in the vanity to hang wash rags or anything else that you may want to hang inside the bathroom. Now this particular model does have the optional shower curtain track if you look to the roof uh, with the hooks and it does come with a curtain in that option. Uh, that curtain is specifically cut for the radius uh, of the ceiling. Uh, if you'll look further inside the bathroom, if you look down beside the toilet you'll notice the little lever here. This is the standard lever for the backflow preventer. Now the reason we call it a backflow preventer is this gate valve is closed while you're driving. It will make sure that whatever wastewater is in your gray tank does not come back up through the plumbing system and enter here in your shower pan, which is the lowest drain point. Now when you are camping, you will want to pull this lever out, which opens that gate valve and that will allow your bathroom sink water as well as your shower pan to drain properly into the gray tank. Again, it's pulled out is open while camping, pressed in, is closed, and that's while you're in transit. Here in the bathroom, we do have a bathroom window. It's located right behind the toilet. Now you'll just simply pull the latch, pop it up into place, and now it's open. The screen does slightly pull up as well uh, to give a little opening at the bottom. And to close it, you'd simply have to pull it out of the little latches here, drop it back into place. Here above the dinette, we have the above head cabinets. They do have the same compression style latches. Inside this cabinet, we'll actually see the cell booster. Um, and there's really no interaction with it either. You can sometimes open it up just to verify that all the lights are green. Uh, if all the lights are green, that means that it is getting the best signal that it can possibly get. Now, the in inside antenna is located up and underneath the cabinet here at the dinette. Uh, it is not an omni antenna, it's just basically a one-way antenna, so it basically shoots straight down in this area. This will be the area you get the best signal from. Uh, as you walk away from the dinette to the bed area or out the door, you'll pretty much lose, lose all of that connection. Now, the big thing to know about it is it is dependent on what signal is available. If AT&T is available, it captures and boosts AT&T, but you have Verizon or T-Mobile or something else, then it's not going to do anything for you. And vice versa with any of the others if it's connecting, but it's not the same service that your phone carries. Now here we have our Furion radio system. Furion radio system works similar to any other radio. Uh, you'd simply power it on. Uh, a couple of things I do want to point out, it is a Bluetooth capable, so you can Bluetooth to your phone, play music from the phone, or even accept phone calls uh, through the radio. Uh, you'll notice zone 1, 2, and 3, we actually just use zone 1 and 2, uh, and there are two speakers to each zone. You can actually press that. You'll notice uh, the 1 and 2 drop off the display here, which means those zones are no longer on. You'll have no volume coming out of those, so you can cut some of the speakers off if you choose to. Now uh, you've got your play, pause, stop, rewind, forward. Those work pretty much the same way. Uh, any other radio uh, functions. A few buttons over here that allow you to specifically select your Bluetooth, your auxiliary, AM, FM, uh, your disc, or USB port. One thing on the USB is if you plug it in here to play music, uh, you will want to make sure that that music on the USB stick um, is upper level. If you store it inside folders, the radio will not be able to play it. Oh, um, one other thing to point out, it is a DVD player, so uh, you put a DVD in here and it will play towards your TV. Let's go ahead and take a look at the lights here uh, at the dinette. You have one light here, it is a touch light, so you just kind of rub the lens and it'll come on and off as you need it. We also have some uh, what we call reading lights, 
and these operate directly at the lens you press in to turn it on and off. The dinette window shade, uh, normally I tell people when you first get started use two hands open and close. Reason being is it is a long window shade. If you accidentally grab one side, you can get it kind of cocked uh, out of line a little bit, and over time it will create an issue with the, the shade. Uh, if you are going to use one hand, I recommend it always trying to grab it as close to the center as possible. But this here is your night shade, and then you also have your day shade. If we take a look at the window. Uh, it's pretty much the same operation as the one in the bathroom. This one's just a side slider. Uh, you, same latch, just open the window up and you can slide the screen open as well. Now, I do want to point out uh, here in the window, there is what we call the water track. There's uh, actually two little tracks in the window and it will fill up with water while it's raining. Uh, that's normal. So if you ever see this water uh, inside the track, it's got little holes at the bottom of the, the inside strip and that's to allow that water to leak out and it should leak out to the outside through the weep holes. Uh, if it ever backs up and comes to the inside, uh, either it, it's clogged up with debris, may need to be cleaned, um, or something else is, is going on with that window. Now let's go ahead and move down towards the dinette and take a look at our dinette. Uh, typically it'll be set up in dinette mode with the table uh, up. Now in order to put that down into bed mode, if you ever want to use this as a side bed, the first step is going to be to loosen the thumb screws. The thumb screws are located underneath the table towards the back brackets. You'll just reach up undo the screws, one on each side. You can take them all the way out or just loosen them enough to pull this table up and off. Now, once we get the table off, you can see the wall brackets, the little hole where the thumb screws screw into. Once we do that, we'll also want to remove this pole. You'll first want to unscrew the collar, twist the pole, and pull it out. Once you do that, you can just store that pole in your closet or anywhere else that you have. You'll take the table, and once we have it uh, slidden down into its opening, we can just pull our cushions down and create our bed. Of course, to get it back up into dinette mode, we just go in reverse. Now, before we go ahead and put this table back up, I'm going to take this opportunity to go ahead and look at a few things that are underneath the dinette. If we look over here on this side, you'll notice two panels. One is your AC panel and one is your DC panel. So the DC panel is going to have all your 12 volt fuses and this is going to have all of your 120 volt breakers. So that's going to be one of the main things to look at if you have a specific thing that's not working, no power going to it, check to make sure a breaker hasn't tripped or a fuse hasn't, hasn't blown. Uh, of course, those can be slightly different setup based on the options that you've chosen. Uh, but either way, it'll be labeled. You can open it up and read the label of which breaker does what. If we go ahead and look at the other side dinette, all right, here on the side of this front dinette, you'll notice a furnace duct. The furnace in the Elite is located under this seat. So you have one main duct here, and you'll have another one located in the bathroom. Of course, below the duct is one of the inside courtesy lights. Uh, we can power that on from the bed area, and once we power it on, you'll see the little bit of light come there. There's also one in the bathroom. Now, the outlet located here on the side of the dinette is our GFCI. All other outlets do run back to this, with the exception of the refrigerator outlet. It's on its own circuit, but uh, if any of the outlets or something's not working, microwave's not working, the GFCI is something that you could take a look at and try to reset. If the reset button's not working, uh, then you may not have any 120 volt power coming into the camper. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the inside of that dinette seat. Here on the inside of the dinette seat, you'll notice the return air vent. Now that is for the furnace and you'll want to make sure that you don't put anything up against that vent because we do need some of the cabin air returning into the furnace. Uh, if you were to block that vent, it could cause the furnace to overheat and it would end up shutting down prematurely. 
To the left of the furnace uh, vent, you'll notice two little ports there. One is a 12-volt cigarette style port, and one is a dual 12-volt USB port. Uh, one thing about the USB port, uh, because it is dual, one of them is a fast charge, the other is not. So if you plug two things in, you, you may notice one charging faster than the other, but that is normal uh, because one, one of those ports does charge faster. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and set the table back up. Do wanna point out the bottom of the pole, you will notice it's a specific shape and it does have to line up. Uh, the way I usually do it is put it on the floor, just kinda slowly turn it until it drops in. Once it drops in, then you'll go ahead and spin it till it's tightened. We'll reach down, go ahead and spin the collar down tight. Now we're ready to go ahead and put the table back on. With the table, I usually just try to line it up a little bit where the pole's gonna slip in. You're gonna hang it on the brackets on the back wall, slide it down on the pole. Now once you do that, the table may not be very steady, and that's where the thumb screws come in. We'll reach back up underneath, go ahead and place our thumb screws back in place. All right, now that the thumb screws are back in place, the table is much more sturdy. Here above the curbside bed area next to your solar uh, charge controller, you do have a cabinet uh, for storage. When you open this in, you'll notice a red switch that is the cutoff for the solar. So you can turn that on and off as necessary. It is for uh, servicing primarily or for storage. Up and under this cabinet, you'll notice some 12 volt ports, USB uh, and the cigarette lighter. You do have these 12 volt ports on the curbside and the street side in the Elite model uh, for both bed areas. If we go ahead and move to the kitchen, uh, you'll notice another cabinet here, uh, quite a bit of storage. This is your largest outside of your uh, rear attic cabinet uh, here in the Elite. In the kitchen, you have the touch lights. And you'll notice uh, your stove is a little different in the Elite. Um, we don't have quite as much counter space. Uh, it's a slightly different stove, uh, but it works the same. You open the glass lid up, you'll press the switch in, turn it to the light, and then push the igniter to, to light the stoves. Once you've used the stove, of course, you want to let it cool before you close this lid back down. And while running the stove, you'll want to run the max air fan to exhaust some of that, uh, those fumes outside the camper. Now, you do get a standard uh, cutting board uh, with your new uh, Legacy Elite. Uh, a slightly different faucet um, is used, but it's basically the same. It's the pull-out faucet uh, with the sprayer. Uh, and of course, you're hot and cold. Here we do have our rear camera monitor already mounted on the wall showing um, what the rear camera is picking up. In order for this to work, it does have to be plugged into a 12 volt uh, lighter style power port and the rear camera has to have power and that power switch is located at your entry door. Here at the kitchen, we have our kitchen galley with our drawers. Uh, you pull the drawers open, they do have soft close. Once they soft close, you will have to press to snap them into a 10 pound uh, latch. It basically means you have the ability to put up to 10 pounds in the drawer and the latch should hold it while driving down the road. If you go above that, uh, or you put something around that rolls back and forth um, that could potentially uh, apply the pressure like opening the drawer, um, they should, should remain closed during travel. You'll notice inside this drawer, we have a fuse box that comes standard with the camper, a few of the uh, blade fuses, uh, 30 amp slow blow jack fuse, and then some screws that will be utilized to screw down the access panels. On the bottom, it's uh, slightly smaller just because the galley is impacted at the back by the wheel well. Um, so it's a little shorter drawer here at the bottom in the Elite. Let's go ahead and take a look at the microwave. In this model, we have our convection microwave, which is an upgrade option. Comes standard with a regular microwave, uh, but of course the microwaves work uh, pretty well the same uh, as anyone that you may have at home. One of the things uh, with this one, you can preheat because it is convection. However, if you try to start it or even preheat it, you'll notice that it says food. And that's just a little safety device. It basically wants to know 
that there's food inside or at least you know that there's nothing inside. In order to get past that, you can simulate opening the door, closing the door. Now it thinks there's food inside and we'll go ahead and do that. And typically, the only time you want to do that is if you are preheating for the convection baking mode. Now let's go ahead and open the door, take a look inside. We do have a little rack as well as your typical turntable tray. With this turntable, I do recommend pulling this out during transit. Um, if you were to hit, hit a pretty good bump, uh, jar this loose and it hits the door, could damage the door um, or even knock it open and damage the plate and flooring uh, or anything that it comes in contact with. Here in the Elite, we have a uh, Norcold refrigerator. There is a little storage cubby above, but with the Norcold fridge, you'll have a on off power button here to the left and then the rest of it is a touch button. This touch button just simply says how cold you want to set the temperature. Um, the more lines, the, the colder it gets. Now here with the A, it's set to auto, and auto will choose. You can move to the plug, which is AC power, the battery, which is battery power, and then the little, looks more like a teardrop, which is gas power. We switch it back to auto. Auto is gonna automatically choose which, and it's gonna start with AC power, Second, it'll choose gas, and third, it should switch to the DC power. Now, on uh, auto, it's gonna be uh, one of the cheapest and most efficient ways to cool it uh, in the AC mode. Um, and gas is gonna be the second most efficient, and then battery is the last means. Battery mode is not gonna effect effectively or efficiently cool the refrigerator. It's just gonna try to maintain what one of the other modes has already achieved. Uh, of course, when you're driving, uh, is, is typically what that battery mode is set up for, to set it to the DC power uh, to try to maintain while you drive to the next campground. Let's go ahead and open the door with our little lever here. And when you look inside, you've got your standard door trays, your racks inside, and then you do have a small freezer. Now, one thing to point out when you do put this up for storage or if you're not going to be using it for a while, we do recommend that you turn it off and open the door. Make sure you put something in there so you can allow air to, to flow through it a little bit. Take a look here at our thermostat. It is a capacitive touch thermostat. Uh, it's got a power symbol with the mode. If you press that, it'll light up and then you can go ahead and select. The first selection is the fan speed. You have the choice to set it to auto, low, or high. The, the big thing to think about when you're setting the fan speed, auto, it will automatically determine what fan speed, either high or low. And in order for it to, to switch from one to the other, it will actually shut completely down before it re-engages into the other fan speed. Both of them are close to the same decibel level as far as if you're listening to how loud it is. So there's not a, a big change and it may actually seem like the AC shutting down only just to kick right back on, but that's the fan. You can change that by putting it in low fan speed. The only thing to think about there is if you put it in low fan speed and then in the winter when you turn the furnace on, the fan will also kick on on the AC in that low speed because it thinks that you want the furnace and the fan on. You'd have to actually go back, set it to auto while using the furnace. Now, if you scroll on through that, uh, past the fan speed, you'll get to AC mode, you'll get to the furnace mode and then back to off. You can press both the up and down buttons. That'll change the Fahrenheit degrees to Celsius and back and forth, uh, whichever one that, that, that you prefer. Now the switch below the thermostat is for the inside courtesy lights. It's those low, uh, low lights that shine just a little bit of light on the floor. Uh, so if you have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, you've got one, one located by the dinette and one inside the bathroom. Of course, we have another cabinet above the rear bedding area here. Um, there's nothing mounted inside this cabinet. This is fully open. There is a service port that just allows us for service purposes to get behind to the wiring of the switch and the thermostat. Now, looking in the back corner, uh, we have some interaction uh, components here. Uh, you have your remote for your inverter. 
Now, the button, the round button, turns the inverter on and off. That is only for boondocking or when you're trying to convert 12 volt battery power into 120 volt power. Um, just keep in mind the amperage and the difference between the two. If the component that you're using typically pulls six amps of 120 volt power, it's gonna pull roughly 60 through the inverter on 12 volt power. Um, if it's something that's, that's quick, useful, uh, as far as the microwave goes, you turn it on for five minutes, even though it's a huge draw, uh, I believe about 130 amps, uh, it's for a short period of time. So it's just a short burst power consumption. Uh, if you're using something like a laptop, then it's, it's potentially going to be drawn out depending on how long you use it. Uh, you can interact with it and push the different buttons like the screen up. It'll show you the current voltage, what battery charge state it's in. Uh, this right here is just showing that it is, uh, we have 120 volt power currently coming in. It's coming out and supplying power to the camper as well as charging the battery. The round button again is only when you are not connected to shore power and you want to turn the inverter on supplying 12 volt in, or into 120 volt into the camper. Now it's already been preset from the factory for you. So typically there's no reason for you to go through any of the settings in the remote. Now below that we have our sea level two tank monitor. Uh, if you press the battery button, it's gonna show you the current voltage and it should be fairly close to what the inverter is reading. If you press your uh, fresh tank button, it's gonna show you how much water is currently on board in the fresh tank. You can press that button twice, you'll notice a little dot comes up. And what that'll do is leave this number up on the screen for a longer period of time, which is useful when you're going and, and filling the fresh tank. So I can go out, turn the water source on, come back in and just sit here and monitor it. Once it gets uh, to about 88%, I usually go back out to cut that water supply off. Uh, you've got your gray and your black readings as well. You do have a water pump switch located here so that you can turn that on. A little green light comes on, uh, tells you that your water pump has power. To the side of that, with this camper, we have an optional Truma AquaGo. Now with the Truma uh, AquaGo, the power switch located outside at the Truma does have to be on first. Once it's on, then this will have power and be able to communicate uh, with the board, uh, the lower board on the Truma. The top, Piece is eco mode, one down is comfort mode, and then off is in the center. Now, talking about eco mode, eco mode is going to make sure that the mixing vessel inside the Truma AquaGo maintains 42 degrees. Uh, it's just to make sure that it does not drop into freezing temperatures. Uh, in the summertime, it's not gonna be there, so it's gonna be pretty well never burning any of your LP um, at that point. I definitely recommend if you choose to leave your Trim Aqua Go on at night when you're really not using the water uh, heater, definitely put it in eco mode so you're not hearing that flame kick in quite as often. Now, the next one is the comfort mode. It keeps that mixing vessel at 102 degrees. Uh, what that does is it's just, it's already hot, a little hotter water. So when you turn the faucet on, it can deliver hot water faster than eco can. You're talking about five to 10 seconds difference. Uh, the next stage is your winterization. Um, you do actually have to purchase the antifreeze kit separate, but that is an option that we have. And what that is, is a 12 volt power down to, to the water heater to maintain the, the mixing vessel temperature so that it does not freeze. It's, um, it's a good thing to have if you're gonna be traveling in cold weather, because that way you can just come in here, turn it to the antifreeze kit. Um, there is a little plug for the exhaust. You plug that in outside. And then that way you can drive and leave it full of water without having to drain it. And the bottom is the clean mode. Typically, you do not want to put it in clean until you're ready to clean. Uh, if you accidentally put it in clean mode within three seconds, it locks it in clean mode. And then you will have to go through the process, which takes up to three hours. Uh, of course, the instructions uh, of how to do that is in the manual. Now, if we look below that, you'll also notice a smoke alarm. This is a smoke and carbon monoxide alarm basically just the same as any one that you might find it at home. It's got a little tray on the side that takes the batteries uh, and then you've got a little test button, silence button. Here on the left side of the rear cabinet, uh, we have our solar charge controller. Now with the solar charge controller, it's already going to be set up for the battery type that you purchased. Um, 
You do have a battery type button here. So if you ever decide to switch to a different type of battery, you can make that change. If we look here, uh, we have some lights and symbols. The first is simply power. The next is charge. It'll light up with a blue light when there's a current charge coming in. And then you have the state of the battery. Right now, uh, we're in the, the second stage. You've got full 75, 50, and pretty well dead battery here. Most of the time you will see it in this stage uh, as this right here is about 95% or higher stage. Uh, if you're inside utilizing the camper, even on shore power, it's gonna be hard to get there because you're constantly pulling that power back out. Now, if we look at these buttons again, you've got an amp bolt button at the top. You can press that once, and that's gonna show you the current amps coming in through the solar. Uh, of course, that only works when there's sunlight out, and it's gonna be constantly changing. You press it again, it's gonna show you your current amp hours for that day, as it does reset every single day. And then you press it again, and it goes back to the voltage reading. Again, this voltage reading should be pretty close to what your inverter uh, or the sea level monitor are showing. Here at the rear cabinet, we also like to call our attic. It's another compression latch. You open it up and you've got a little bit more storage area. There are some things located inside. Here to the left, the first is an optional Omni HD antenna. Uh, this is the switch plate for that. You do have a little button back here to turn that antenna on and off. You also have a satellite connection as well as a TV out connection. Now the satellite connection would only be used, of course, if you have a satellite receiver mounted back here uh, with the satellite antenna outside the camper. You'll also notice that we have an HDMI pulled to this rear area here so that you can add your own Blu-ray player or Apple TV or other device um, and run it through here to the TV. Now let's take a look at the other side of the cabinet. Here in the rear cabinet, we also have the surge protector display. Now, anytime that you're connected to 120 volt power through a shore connection or a generator, this will light up and start providing information about that incoming power. You'll see it scrolling through several numbers. The first is usually uh, your voltage. Then you're gonna get your reading for your Hertz, uh, 120, uh, your amp load, your Hertz, and then uh, if there's any errors. You're looking for an E0. E0 simply means no errors. If it's showing anything from an E1 to an E10, then there is problem with that incoming power and you're not actually receiving power into the camper. That surge protector will stop it uh, from hitting the converter box and thereby not sending it out to, to the appliances. Now, if you have an error code, you can call the Oliver Service Department um, or Progressive Industries to get help with the error. Uh, if you're seeing an E0, but then after E0, you see a PE error code, that means you're having intermittent issues. Uh, and that typically happens with uh, overloaded campgrounds uh, where voltage issues are occurring and it's dropping below the minimum. Minimum voltage is about 104. So if you hook up in a campground and see 108, 109, then you've got a higher chance of seeing that voltage drop low that constant dropping of voltage builds up heat and can create an issue before the surge protector. Surge protector does protect everything inside the camper, but your power cord, your power inlet, uh, and if equipped, your transfer switch uh, would all be susceptible to damage if you continue to allow that power to keep having intermittent issues like that. Now you'll notice a switch here, it's uh, in normal use. You do have a bypass EMS. We do not recommend that you use that. Um, the only time that you might even consider it is if you're running on your own generator. Uh, as a generator, people don't typically ground them, so it's going to see it as a non-grounded power source and not allow the power to come in. In a situation, you could bypass the EMS. However, if you forget and hook to regular shore power, it can create, uh, create damage. Um, for a generator uh, use, we definitely recommend a neutral ground plug, uh, and we do have those for sale in the service department. We're going to take a look at the Cradle Point. Uh, it is our new Wi-Fi option. It's available on both the uh, Legacy Elite and Legacy Elite 2 models. Uh, now, with this, what it does is it utilizes a cell antenna, uh, and it reaches out, brings that cell signal into the camper into a Wi-Fi router, uh, and then it allows you to turn that into your own dedicated Wi-Fi signal uh, inside the camper. Now it does have the two bands, 2.5 gig and the uh, 5 gigahertz uh, bands. 
the five is a little bit faster and works really nice inside the camper. The two and a half uh, is, is not as fast, but it does go a little bit further. Uh, and you may actually be able to utilize it and stay connected even inside the tow vehicle. Now, if you see here, the cradle point does appear that it is mounted upside down. However, we did this on purpose so that you can uh, see the, the status lights on this side without having to try to get a mirror and look to the back side. Uh, the back side has some, some ports and things like that, but we don't use those. Um, but with this particular system, it comes with two SIM cards, an AT&T and a Verizon. Uh, you can only use one at a time. Both can be left inside the router, and you would simply contact the mobility help desk and set up a data plan on one uh, or the other SIM card. Once you have your data plan, uh, you can get unlimited or a certain amount each month. Um, you can also shut that down. Uh, because this is going into a camper and you're not always going to be out and on the road, you can contact them uh, and kind of pause it or, or shut it down for a while until you get ready to go back out on the road again. Uh, you can also uh, get an app uh, and set up an account uh, through them so that you can manage this uh, yourself. Of course, all of those questions, you'd need to contact the Mobility Help Desk to actually uh, speak with them uh, to get all that information together. But uh, once you get this option at delivery, you'll also be given kind of a, a little piece of paper with all the information as far as who to contact uh, for the data plan setting it up. Uh, you can also have uh, troubleshooting assistance from uh, two different companies, one being Oliver and the other being uh, who we actually purchased the Cradle Point uh, through. Uh, and you can also actually call Cradle Point as well. Uh, so you have definitely plenty of people to, to get assistance from. Here in the curbside corner of the camper, uh, we have the TV. Now it does swivel a little bit to change direction. It is a hard mount in the corner in the Elite. Um, there's not enough room in this particular model for the flip down like in the Elite 2 because this rear window is your exit emergency window. Uh, but it does pivot um, and it does work the same. Uh, it's an AC powered TV, which means it is plugged in and does require either 120 volt power or while boondocking, you would have to have your inverter turned on to utilize the, the Vizio. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, rear emergency window. Window shade operates the same, your night shade, your day shade. Once we have it open, have your same latch, your same sliding style window. However, this screen does not slide. It is an emergency screen only, and you would actually have to pull this tab. You pull this tab, the screen pops loose, and then you'd pull your red handles, and then push the window open, slide down the spare tire cover. Hopefully you'll never have to use the emergency uh, window, but it is there just in case. Now, if you ever do pull this uh, screen off, you'll notice that it just has little clips on it. So you'll just kind of have to position it back on the frame where it sits. And then just kind of press in until it pops in place. We're going to take a look at the window shade, uh, how to remove it from the window and reinstall. So what you'll want to do is grab a hold of the bottom rail and we're just going to pull straight out away from the window. It's going to pop off of the metal clips underneath. Uh, there's three on the bottom and there should be three on top as well. Once we have the bottom removed, we would just pull the top off. Now I want to take a look at the back of it. Um, you'll see here the plastic rail on the back of the window shade. That's where the metal clips sit. Uh, anytime that you pull it off, you will want to double check, make sure all the clips are good. Make sure if any are loose, you may need to tighten them up a little bit. Um, you also check um, the plastic rail on the back here. Over time, removing and reinstalling this, the plastic will start to wear against the metal. Um, and you may find that you need to either replace the window shade or relocate the metal clip so it's no longer biting in the same spot in this uh, plastic rail here. Uh, once you get ready to reinstall it, you will hang the top section first. You just simply line it up with the metal clips, you'll have to give it a firm press at each clip location. 
Once you have it hung on the top, you'll do the same with the bottom. Just kind of line it up. And now your window shade is back in place. This is the same air conditioner uh, that we use in our uh, larger Elite 2 model. Uh, it works the same way uh, where you can open and close the vents. Uh, now you have to keep in mind your AC is right on top of here uh, with that high velocity of air being dumped down into this air box. So the more vents you close, the louder it's going to get as you're trapping that air behind this uh, box itself. The more vents you open and the air has somewhere to go, uh, it'll quieten it down just a little bit. You do also have the filters in the front, both sides, that you'll want to pull out, rinse off, dry, and slide back in. Right. And in front of the AC, we have our exhaust fan. Now, if you're running the air conditioner, you typically will not want the exhaust fan running in or out because you're basically putting cold air into the cabin and then either venting it straight back out or pulling hot air in at the same time cold air is coming in, creating a moisture issue. Um, you should use this, however, when you're running the stove uh, or if you're not running uh, the air conditioner and you want to just either pull some fresh air in uh, or vent air that's inside out. Otherwise, this is the exact same Max Air that's in our uh, Elite 2, works uh, pretty much the exact same. You've got your own off switch here. Uh, you can change the direction of flow, either bringing air in or taking air out. Uh, and then you can uh, control the speed with the plus and minus. Now you do have the manual crank here in case you needed to open or close the lid outside manually. And that outside lid on this fan is rainproof, so you can use this fan when it's raining, but you would want it closed when traveling. Uh, to clean this, it works the same. You'd spin these little clips. Once you spun those clips, you can pull this down, you can rinse this off. You can also get in here and clean these fan blades if you need to. Here in the Elite, we're gonna go ahead and put our table down into bed mode. And one of the first things you'll need to do is just remove this little tray out of the way so that we can pull this table up off of the brackets on the wall and the pole. Once you have the table pulled up and off, you'll just simply rotate. So the same style pole that's used on the dinette, once we have that pole out of the way, we'll want to lay the table down into the opening to create the bed. If you noticed, our filler panel is already in the back and you can definitely leave the filler panel um, in there even when it's in bed mode. It still allows plenty of leg room or you can store that inside the closet. It does come with Velcro, so it can be uh, stuck to the, to the inside edge of the closet wall. But let's go ahead and lay this down. You will notice on the Elite model that the filler panel goes to the back. Typically, from what we see, most people that get this con bed configuration, for the most of the time, they leave it down into the bed mode, which is perfectly fine. You can either take this tray and stow it in the closet, or you can place it back in the wall. Now it becomes like a little nightstand beside the bed. Now that our table is down in the proper position, we're gonna to wanna to set our cushions up. Now the two outside cushions have the radius, so we'll leave them in place. We'll take our back cushions and go ahead and move them down into the bed mode. Now we do have two cushions left over. Uh, you could leave them attached and run them up the wall, detach them. Well, now you have two uh, pillows to use. Now we're just gonna simply go ahead and put it back into table mode. So we'll pull our cushions up out of bed mode. And move our table. Again, the filler panel can be placed in the closet or you can leave it to uh, Leave it in that mode. If you leave it there while driving, um, it is possible that it could fall out because it's not hard uh, attached to anything. It's just kind of laying in the track. We're going to go ahead and take and place our pole back down on the floor. Mm -hmm. 
once you hang the back side of the table on the brackets, we'll try to line it up and get it lined up with our pole. Of course, this one uh, has thumb screws as well so that you can tighten it up to keep that uh, table from rocking. Once you have the table ready to go, we simply slide the little tray back into place. All right, we're going to take a look under our front access panel. This is under the front dinette. It is not a storage compartment, but if you lift it up, you'll be able to see the furnace below as well as the ducting. And typically this is only going to be for servicing, uh, but we did want to take a look to let you know what was located under the front dinette. Let's go ahead and move back to the next dinette access panel. The rear dinette, we have another access panel. Again, it's not for storage. Uh, it is for servicing. However, you may on occasion have to get inside this uh, compartment. Uh, some of the things are the wires that just go into the back of the panels, which should be done by a uh, service technician. Now you'll also notice a ground bar um, and then our 12 volt battery breaker. The 12 volt battery breaker is for some reason, if it ever happens and it kicks, you'll notice a little arm will pop up to the side and you may have to reset it. You'll also notice some inline fuses here. Uh, the yellow capsules, those are the fuses for your jacks. Um, if you have a jack that's not operating, uh, you may want to get in here, pull those capsules apart to take a look at the fuses. You'll also have an inline fuse for your LP alarm. And if equipped, you'll also have another inline fuse here and this uh, white plastic uh, for the compost toilet fan. Now, this is the inverter, and typically you will not have to get in here to interact with the inverter as we have a remote switch. Uh, if you ever get in here and do interact and turn it on at this switch, the remote switch will no longer function. So typically you wanna leave this alone unless you're getting in here for a specific reason. Here in our uh, bed area under the street side bed, we're gonna go ahead and pull our access panels off. Again, these are not for storage. Um, one of the things you'll notice is this, which is your battery box from the outside. To the right, we have one of our rear jacks, which you might have to access in case you have to manually crank it for some reason. To the left of the battery box, we have our surge protector, our outside water uh, connection, uh, and then some plumbing and wiring. Again, this is just primarily a service port um, when necessary to get to. Here under the curbside bed, we have two more access panels. Again, not storage compartments. However, you may need to get into this storage area. Now on the far left side, we have our other rear jack for manual cranking if necessary. We have our water heater. This is the Truma water heater, but uh, they come standard with the Suburban. However, if you look to the bottom downside of the Truma water heater, you'll notice the bypass valve. That valve is utilized when you're going to be winterizing or storing the camper. Otherwise, you'd leave it in the open mode to allow water into the water heater. Now, here we have our water pump and our accumulator at the rear. Uh, you'll also have your water pump valves, and those valves you'll configure based on what you're wanting to do pulling from. Uh, you have two valves on the left. Those valves uh, tell it where to pull from, either the fresh tank or from the rear port. And then the ones on the right tell it where to supply that water or fluid to. It'll either supply that directly back into the fresh tank or to the faucets. Welcome to Oliver Travel Trailers. Today we're going to take a look at the Anderson weight distribution hitch and how to properly disconnect from the tow vehicle and then reconnect when you're ready to take off. Let's go ahead and take a look now. First step we want to do is go ahead and disconnect the seven pin from the tow vehicle. You'll always want to disconnect this because if you leave it hooked up overnight, it'll go ahead and continue pulling 12 volt power from the tow vehicle and cause it to drain the batteries. 
Now we do run the cable through this little metal clip in the Bulldog coupler. Uh, we do that just to secure this cable a little better. You can go ahead and remove that as well. Kind of put that seven pin cable off to the side. First, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect the breakaway cable. Then we'll go ahead and take our chains loose. Now once we have our chains loose, the next step is gonna be disconnecting the Anderson weight distribution hitch. Now on that, what we're gonna do, the easiest method that we have found is go ahead and leave this connected here at the ball and raise the front end of the camper just a little bit. What we're trying to do is remove the uh, tongue weight from the tow vehicle and it's gonna put some slack in these chains here that are currently tight. Once we've raised it up a little bit, now we have that slack in the, in the chains, we can go ahead and pull the pin. Sometimes this may be a little tight, you may have to wiggle this as you pull the pin out. But once you've got the pin out of the way, you can just drop that. Then you'd wanna go ahead, lower the jack or the camper. Once we've got it lowered back down, then we can go ahead and pop open the coupler raise the jack off of the tow vehicle. And at this point, uh, you just simply pull the tow vehicle forward, go ahead and level up the camper, and you're ready to go. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at hooking back up the tow vehicle once we're breaking camp, getting ready to go. The first thing, of course, you'll wanna do is pull the tow vehicle up and under the coupler. Uh, once you've got it lined up, we'll go ahead and just drop the trailer down on the tow vehicle. All right. Now once we have it down, we'll go ahead and set the coupler lock on there. Now at this point, because we're looking at the Anderson weight distribution hitch, we're gonna wanna hook it up. The easiest way is to go ahead, now that we've got this coupled, we're gonna raise the front of the trailer back up a little bit. And I typically wanna raise it until I see all of the weight taken off of the hitch here. Once we do that, we want to go ahead and just take the little triangle plate, stretch the chains forward, slide it up on the bottom of that ball, and then we should be able to put our pin through. All right. Now that we've got that locked in, we can go ahead and drop the camper back down. Mm -hmm. And our Anderson chains are good and tight at this point. Now what we'll want to do is go ahead and hook our tow chains up. We typically crisscross these. All right. You'll want to connect your safety breakaway as well. Make sure this is always connected to the tow vehicle. You do not want to connect this to the safety chains or something that could come loose from the tow vehicle. Then of course, we'll wanna go ahead and put our pin through the coupler to lock it down and in place. Placing our seven pin cable inside just so that it kinda helps hold it there and secure. And then we just plug our seven pin into the tow vehicle. At this point, you'd wanna just do a walk around of the camper, double check the rear jacks and check the lights and you're good to go. Sometimes when backing into a campsite, you may find that in order to get the trailer straight and in the campsite, the truck itself may be at a slight angle. Now this is okay, and if you take a look here, you'll notice the triangle plate chains, everything is still nice and straight with the camper itself, but the ball housing and the ball mount with the truck is at a slight angle. Now, this does not change the way that you would disconnect the Anderson ball at this time. However, uh, in a moment, we will look at how it might change reconnecting to the Anderson. Uh, but it, again, at this point, it's not gonna change the way that we disconnect. We'd simply lower our jack, which we'll go ahead and do now. 
Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and lower the jack down so I can take the pressure off the back of the truck. It'll give us some slack in our chains and make it a lot easier to go ahead and drop the triangle plate from the Anderson ball. First I'm going to look at right, uh, raising it just enough so that I see a little bit of movement in that ball mount. Uh, that'll tell me that it's removed the weight from the ball, uh, but we don't want to lift the back end of the truck. Once we do that, we'll go ahead and just take the pin out. We can drop our chains. Right. Now before we go ahead and pull the coupler open, we're gonna wanna go ahead and lower the camper back down because right now we've pulled up on that ball. If we were to go ahead and pop it loose, it'll snap the two apart. So we want to go ahead and put some of that weight back down on the ball. And then once we have it open, we just go ahead and take the camper completely off the back of the truck. So pretty much the same exact disconnect method, uh, even though we are at an angle. However, now what we want to look at is when we get ready to hook back up, if we are able to pull in straight and back up and connect straight, how that's going to affect the Anderson and what to do if that happens. All right, so now we want to look at it to where we've backed up and we're getting ready to reconnect to the Anderson. Now, when we disconnected, we were at an angle with the truck, but now you can see we're straight in line with the camper. If you look a little closer, though, at our pin, it's not going straight across the ball. It's kind of turned to an angle, which is going to make it difficult to get the triangle plate back on. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. The way that Anderson recommends is actually to loosen uh, from the bracket until you can get the triangle plate on and then tighten the side you need to to get it to turn that ball to the direction that you're wanting it. The other way in which we're going to show you is to close this on to the, to the ball. Close the coupler down onto the ball and depending on if you have someone to help they could come back here and help hold some of the chains up because we're going to actually getting the, uh, the tow vehicle and pull up and forward and to a certain direction in order to turn it because what we're turning is this mount and this housing and we've got to turn it back to the same direction we were when we disconnected which is slightly to the to the left of us right. the next thing we'll want to do is definitely go ahead and raise our jack Raising the jack lowers the camper back down onto the ball in the tow vehicle. Now I'm not going to raise it all the way up because I'm barely going to move and turn slightly to the left. Uh, and then that way we'll be able to see how that housing rotates. So what I did was uh, just simply made a very sharp turn to the left as I pulled up, put the tow vehicle back in about the same spot it was in when we had originally disconnected. So what that has done is turn this pin directly straight line across the coupler here, which will make it a lot easier to hook this triangle plate back up. So let's go ahead and do that now. Again, we're just raising it up to bring the weight off of the tow vehicle, which will give us a little bit more slack in our chains to make it easier to connect. And once you have the triangle plate on, we'll want to go ahead and put the pin in. Now I do recommend a small mallet dead blow. It does make it a little easier to put the pin back in. Sometimes it can be a little tight if it's not perfectly lined up. But once we have the triangle plate hook back up, then we'd simply lower the camper back onto the tow vehicle. 
that will give us the tension in our Anderson chains. And the last thing we'd want to do is just go ahead and reconnect our safety chains, our breakaway, and our 7 pin. And don't forget your little safety pin for the coupler. And once your jack is fully retracted, you're ready to go. Let's take a look at the Anderson chains. Now you'll see some tension now that we've lowered the Kemper back on the tow vehicle. The more tension you have, the more weight distribution it'll apply across the tow vehicle. And of course each chain kind of works against the other in order to, to have the anti-sway feature. But let's take a look at tightening up these chains in case you want to apply a little bit more weight distribution to the tow vehicle. Now the easiest way to do that is we're gonna go ahead and raise the, the camper back off the tow vehicle, giving us a little bit of slack in the chains and that makes it a little bit easier to tighten it. Now you don't want to go too far with it, we just want a little bit of uh, slack in the chains as you can see. Now we're going to crawl up underneath the camper so that we can tighten each side. Here under the camper we're looking at the A-frame section. And of course this big section here is our straight tongue that comes through the, the center. Uh, the Anderson brackets are actually installed here. Uh, in the A-frame section, not on the complete outside, but just inside in the center supports. So what we want to do in order to tighten these chains up a little bit to give a little bit more weight distribution, we'll take the socket that is supplied with the Anderson kit and come under here, tighten it up just a bit. Now you'll want to count the uh, threads that you have on one side to the other to try to match them as close as possible. But once you've tightened both sides up, We'll go ahead and drop the weight back on the tow vehicle and see if it is the weight that we're, we're wanting. If not, we just come back here and start the process over again to tighten it up just a little bit more. Now that we've tightened our chains, we're going to go ahead and drop the camper back on the tow vehicle to check and see what our tension is with the weight added. Once we've dropped it down, the Tension has been added back to those chains, and of course this time we could take a look at the tow vehicle to see if some of that weight distribution has been applied across the front end. And if not, we could simply just raise the camper back up and go ahead and tighten it just a little bit more until we get it exactly where we think it needs to be.